13th meeting of the Town Council to order. Would the clerk please call the roll? Council Chair Sherman? Here. Councilor Gouvenali? Here. Councilor Jordan? Here. Councilor Lennon? Here. Councilor Sullivan? Here. Councilor Swift Kayata? Here. Councilor Walsh? Here. Uh, please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, Town Council reports and correspondence. Jim. David, uh, we were awarded by the Greater Portland Council of Governments this last week um, an award for the best practices in citizen participation and communications. And uh, this award was given by the uh, Council to us for our communication strategy, which was one of our objectives last year and created and uh, implemented uh, throughout uh, town government and one that uh, they have uh, singled out as being um, uh, an, a very effective way to provide information on municipal and local issues to citizens and other parties and to use as a best-in-class example to other towns in the area. So we're going to give this to Mr. McGovern who can put it on the wall in either his office or outside his office. Outside. outside. But I wanted to, to make sure everybody understands that uh, we were uh, applauded for our effort in this regard and we continue to work at it. Thank right. you. All right. Thanks, Jim. Any other reports or correspondence? Jessica? I'd just like to mention a, a, a thank you and appreciation to Jim Hubner and all involved in the Memorial Day parade and service that the town held. Thanks, Jessica. Any others? I just want to compliment the organizers of last weekend's Family Fun Day. Uh, I had the uh, pleasure of participating in the parade with my son's Little League team, although the ambulance was right behind us for the entire parade with the siren going. <laughs> Uh, that and the screaming children I, uh, took me a while to recover. And the, uh, the carnival atmosphere at Family Fun Day at Fort Williams was just terrific. Despite the lousy weather, it was well attended and a lot of fun. Um, and I also, uh, it sort of was the Cape weekend for the Sherman family anyway. I had a, a son graduate from high school yesterday and just my hats off to everybody uh, at the high school, the principal, school board, et cetera, for a terrific celebration of our children's graduation. It really just makes you feel very proud to live in Cape Elizabeth. Ann. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't recall it until just a second ago, but uh, I attended along with a number of other counselors uh, and uh, trustees of the Thomas Memorial Library, uh, an update on uh, architectural ideas for arch architectural plans. There are no plans as of yet, um, but just thoughts, sort of a, a brainstorming session on uh, plans for possible uh, ways that the uh, Thomas Memorial Library could be laid out. And I want to thank the trustees and the Building Study Committee and Jay Sharma and his staff for all their hard work on it. Work is ongoing. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, this is then the first opportunity in uh, tonight's meeting for citizens to discuss items that are not on the meeting agenda. So if anybody would like to, you're welcome to approach the podium and uh, you would have three minutes to speak. Yes, sir. If you could just please identify yourself, uh, that would be appreciated. Denison. 63 is going down. I don't think this is on your agenda, but I think it's coming up. Fort Williams. I hope this council will remember how many times the citizens have voted no fees. There wasn't any exceptions. And I hope you remember that when it comes up. I think you got a nice fort there. There's things that can be done. But we are in a recession, and uh, I think we could use the money. Uh, expand the store down there if it's doing as good as you people have said it is and use some of that money but I, I hope you take into consideration the citizens feelings on their prior votes thank you right. thank you and actually the uh, 
If you're speaking in terms of the bus fees, there will correct. Okay, that is on the agenda, and oh, I didn't so. think it was. That's okay. I'm sorry. No problem. Thank you. Anybody else? And I would now turn to the uh, town manager's report. Yeah, uh, thank you, David. A uh, couple of things while, while this uh, comes up. We'll see. We're having trouble with it early today, so we'll see how well it works. Uh, in, in addition to all the other thanks, I want to do acknowledge, uh, since the last time we met, we had the uh, state senate election, and want to thank Deborah for all of her efforts and all those that helped out with that election, and congratulate uh, Senator Dill uh, on her election. And also, I did want to make mention, uh, you know, for all the different events, uh, everything from Family Fun Day to Memorial Day Parade, really want to recognize the work that the Department of Public Works does and all of the, the people that help prepare our parks and our grounds uh, for the spring. And in addition to all the work they did, if you notice, out on the uh, town hall front lawn, we had the case of grubs. And that actually uh, was, the, to fix that, uh, the materials were donated by Mike Jordan of Jordan's Lawn and Garden Center, and Nick Tamaro uh, did all of the repair work. So, you know, a, a, again, a, a good example of the private sector stepping forward, helping out, as well as working uh, with our public works department. I'll give this a try. We'll see. I uh, had sh real problems with this was shifting all over the place early today, so we'll see how it works. Recently, the United States Department of Commerce, the Bureau of the Census, came out with census statistics uh, for the year 2010. Uh, the census was actually done back all of the numbers as of April 1, 2010. And I think when you, when you look at these numbers, and in this, uh, this is online as well, uh, I think it, it really tells you an awful lot about Cape Elizabeth, where we've been, where we are and perhaps where we're going. Uh, so what this brief presentation does looks at how our population has changed and we also look at these other six communities. You, you asked why are we looking at these six, the question is always asked. Uh, in this instance, we've been looking at these communities since 1990 and we, so we dug out the 70 data and the 80 data back then and to try to go back and to get new towns and to go back that far would be difficult. But, but it, basically, these are the inner ring towns around the city of Portland. Uh, if you look at our, our overall population, the big number, it, for those of you that were here in the 60s, there was quite a bit of growth, though this doesn't show it. Uh, we actually leveled off population uh, between 1970 and 1980, uh, was just about the same. When, when people talk about growth in Cape Elizabeth, and as it relates to population, uh, the really huge growth was in the 1980s, from 1980 to 1990. And, and not only did we, we have population growth then, but as you'll see later on, we also had, a, uh, we had housing growth because pop, ever since 1970, the, housing, the household size has kept getting smaller. So, you know, simply to you know, add more population, there's other, there's other variables go, going on as well. As you can see, over the last 20 years, population has uh, actually... Uh, been fairly stable. Over the whole 40 years, uh, we gained an average of 30 people, uh, 31 folks, uh, over the course of that 40 period each year. Uh, if you look at, this is, you have to keep reminding, because you have to be careful with the headings in this, because we're switching back and forth as to what we're looking at. This is actually a 20 year period from 1990 to 2010. During this period, we had an overall growth of a little under 2%. What's interesting is, and it comes, comes up a little bit later, we've had more growth in housing units than in households. And the difference is a housing unit doesn't need to be occupied. A household needs to be occupied. Mike, is that total growth of 161 people? People, that's people. Yeah, that's people, and then we're switching to housing units. So basically, the, the point being made is, while well, we have growth of 1.8% in population, in actual housing units, we had almost 15%, and in households, we had 11%. And back during when the census was taken, we had almost 350 homes that were vacant. And this includes all those that go to Florida, who aren't back by April 1. And it also, we had 50 rental units that were vacant back last April 1st. And then we had 50 units, 50 homes mostly, that were in transition. They were for sale, and the, the folks had moved out, 
or they had sold and the new folks hadn't moved in. I'm surprised at the 18 number, but again, that's what the, the census reported. The, the next statistic I think is fascinating. Cape Elizabeth is not thought of as a place that has a lot of folks that rent property. Uh, however, one out of every nine residents in 2010 actually rented property in Cape Elizabeth. I think that number is probably a lot higher than, than the, the thought is when people think of Cape Elizabeth. Again, during this 20-year period, you know, a, a household size decreased, but that isn't anywhere near the decrease that we, we saw in the, uh, in the 70s and 80s. We were, we were once up to almost four folks per household, and now we're at 2.5. This is, this is uh, to me, really fascinating. Uh, uh, I was in the category of under 55 or fi uh, back when the census was, but I'm now, I'm, I'm now in that 55 uh, point, so the, the, these statistics mean a little more to me. Uh, you have having trouble making that statement. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you look at, you know, again, if you look at the headings, a little tricky. It's 70, 90, in 2010, 20-year intervals. However, the last column, is actually the last 10 years. It's 2000 to 2010. So you look at the population, you can look at any of these numbers. Of, of those that are 0 to 18, or 0 to 17, uh, 0 to 18 is not available. 0 to 17, uh, that, that group of population has actually gone from 38% of the total population, and now it's only a quarter of the population. If you look at the, the, those 55 and over, that was 17% of the population, and it's now doubled. It's 34% of the overall population. And you look at the, the raw numbers, uh, you know, all of the growth that we're having is really in ages 55 and over. And uh, you know, it's particularly interesting, uh, the, the one I didn't highlight is if you look at the population 25 to 44, this generally is when, you know, folks have kids, uh, no, you know, not necessarily totally within that age group, but it's mostly when kids are born. That part of the population has, has really uh, declined in, in raw numbers. You know, to lose 575 of that population in a 10-year period is, is pretty significant of the, the childbearing age. Uh, and, and this sort of ties in the same thing, but it looks at it slightly different. And what it, what it really brings in is the, by putting when, when these folks were born, and you can see how it, it lines up with the baby boom. If you look at that 55 to 64 age group at the beginning, this isn't the whole baby boom generation, but it is those that came in immediately after World War II through 1955. And that group alone in the last 10 years increased 72% in, in raw numbers as to those that are in that age group. Uh, overall, 55 plus increased 865. That includes, you know, uh, all those above 64 as well, if you're trying to figure out all the numbers. And again, that, that 25 to 44 group, uh, that dropped 27 percent. Uh, you know, pretty significant. Uh, we often get asked how many households have school-age kids. Uh, we don't know exactly because they don't report it, but what they do report is that a little over 1,200 households have individuals under the age of 18. This would be 0 to 17, roughly a third of the households. Uh, over 65, we were talking 55, this is over 65, we have a little over 1,000 households now have uh, folks over the age of 65 or almost 30 percent of the homes in Cape Elizabeth. The other interesting thing we're seeing is we're seeing more renter-occupied homes in Cape Elizabeth. Back in 1990, there were about 460, and now, now it's about 520. Uh, we're also seeing more vacant units. And what's interesting, if you look at, for example, the vacant units between 2000 and 2010, we, we had 111, I think is the number, more vacant housing units. So even the households that were built during the last 10 years, the, popu the reason the population went down, in part, is because we had that many more vacant units. And vacant units does include the snowbirds, includes those rents, includes those homes. Question as an answer, Mike. So, a vacant unit is any household that doesn't have somebody living it on the date of the census. Exactly. So, if you're in Florida, 51 percent of the year, you're not counted. That's vacant. You're vacant. Right. So, it's nothing to do with houses for sale that are on the market. It's 50 of those units are houses for sale. The other thing we believe is happening with renter occupied is in in large part because of the economy. 
when people can't sell their homes, instead they're, they're renting it out to someone else. And we're seeing some neighborhoods that are having more and more rental properties. I know some of you, some people are renting their home on a, on a nightly basis even. Uh, down by the water we're seeing about 12 to 15 homes are advertised that way and online that uh, they're being rented on a nightly basis. So it's a, it's a different phenomena we're, be, we're beginning to see. Uh, if you look at how we're comparing with these, with these regional towns, what this shows again is from 1990 to 2010, the last 20 year period. And it shows that there were about 16,500 extra citizens in these six towns during, that came in during that 20 year period. If you look at where Cape Elizabeth stood, out of the growth of 16,500, we were roughly 1% of that pie. So, you know, when, when, when we talk about growth, and, and again, this is population, not housing units, but we talk about growth in Cape Elizabeth, and you hear, you know, many complaints about growth. It's, it's all sort of relative. You know, Yarmouth was 3%, Cumberland was 8%. It's no secret that Falmouth, Gorham, and Scarborough had a lot more growth during the last uh, 20 years. But it ended up Cape Elizabeth, it was just about eight additional folks per year uh, the population increased during the last 20 years. If you look simply at the last 10 years, uh, we actually lost an average of five people a year. Uh, and the other interesting thing to see, if you look at the column additional persons in the middle, the, the bottom number there is 5,002. You go back to the last sheet, it was 6,474. So out of the last, the population growth in the last 20 years, 11,500 of it roughly was in the first 10 years and only 5,000 of it was in the second 10 years. In other words, the growth rate from 2000 to 2010 was half of what it was in, uh, from uh, 1990 to 2000. You can also see in 2000, 2010, surprisingly it was Gorham that had the biggest population growth. Everyone looks at Scarborough and always thinks it's Scarborough, but uh, Gorham was actually up about 45%. Again, Cape and Yarmouth uh, both lost a little population in the last 10 years. Uh, so summarizing that section of it, Cape Elizabeth's absorbed 1% of the growth of the inner suburban towns. Uh, while population since 1990 has increased 2%, uh, housing units have increased about 15%. We're seeing increased vacant units, 148 more since 1990, and we think that's because of so many people being away, and we're seeing more and more rental units. So the point of all this is that you know, every business, every government needs to be looking at these demographic issues. You know, it, it's no secret that the baby boom is getting older. Uh, but, you know, a lot of things have been forecast. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. We're now, you know, the, we now have the numbers that, that back up what the forecast were. Uh, and it has huge implications for public policy. I was, did this presentation the department heads early today, and we were talking, for example, how does it affect the fire department? Well, you know, obviously you're responding to a lot more rescue calls as people get older. But the other thing is, is your volunteers have generally been in that younger age group and, you know, you get some people aged 55 years old, older volunteering. In fact, they've been some of our best volunteers, but we're not getting the younger volunteers. You know, it's amazing, again, that the fire department has managed to keep the younger volunteers uh, for the fire companies themselves. But it really, as you look, it, you know, it, it makes you wonder what's going to happen with the rescue. It, it raises issues with code enforcement. Do we need to be doing more in terms, you know, we're getting more and more calls about rental units and folks concerned with heating issues and some of those things you typically get with landlord-tenant relations. Uh, we, we, we're getting more and more of those calls. You know, it's, I believe that uh, it would be very helpful at some point for the council, the school board, planning board, to really look at these numbers and to, to brainstorm of what does it mean for the different services we provide? What does it mean for some of the public policy issues you look at? and and how does it all play out? I, I, I look at, you know, my conclusion is basically we've, we've got to deal with this reality. Uh, we, we sort of know what's coming. We know the baby boomer is going to get older. Uh, but, you know, we go back to, if you look at the 70s and 80s, Cape Elizabeth really made its mark as a family-friendly community. And you have all of these homes that are occupied by people age 55 and over. And, you know, they want to have some, some of them want to have lower taxes. 
but they also want to make sure that their property values are maintained. And I think you need to look back at, you know, and, and I know we've had the debate sometimes, to what degree is it the town's responsibility to help maintain property values as the private sector. But if a community doesn't balance out the needs of the future generations and, and trying to protect the investments uh, to continue to make the town family friendly with, the, with some of the concerns of those 55 and older uh, who want less in taxes, if, if, we, if we don't find the proper balance, we're in tough shape. And so my point is, is we need to think about that. And I think as you look at your agendas, you look at how you're spending your time on, on different issues, I, I think it should be with the backdrop of some of these issues uh, and some of the demographics that we're looking at. We, we're definitely getting older, and uh, it, it makes, you know, we're seeing it all, and we're also seeing it, community services is struggling with enrollments and programs. They just had to cancel something they'd done 22 straight years, of an outing for middle school students. Uh, there's all these things going on, and when we look at the census, it begins to provide answers as to why this is happening, but what it fails to do is really provide the answers of what we should do as a result of all these, these things happening. So I, I encourage the council over the summer and in the fall to look at some of these issues. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Does anybody have any questions for Mike on this? Frank? I think just as an observation, Mike, when you look at the, uh, the shift in population, uh, 25 to 44, we saw a decline of 5 to 5 to 75. Over 55, an increase of 865, which seems to suggest to me that basically uh, people are staying in town as their kids get older and move out, which is causing a decline in the, the average inhabitants per household. And what it really raises the question is, these folks who are empty nesters now, are they going to stay here? Is the economy causing them to stay here because their housing values are lower than they think they are? Um, and if the economy improves and housing values stabilize, will they move out and bring another resurgence of growth with younger kids? Yep. And it might be worthwhile as we think about this over the next six months or whatever, maybe even do a, s a simple survey mm -hmm. of people in this category and say propensity to move, propensity to downscale, and how that may affect population adjustments in the future years. No, it's, it's we, we don't know those answers. And, no. uh, yeah, I do know when Falmouth Back in 1980, we had about the oldest population, population of anywhere in the state. And then they had all the, the schools they needed to do and all that, and everyone blamed it on the new homes. The reality was that about 65% of the growth in school population in Falmouth was a result of exactly what you were just describing. It was as a result of people moving out, being replaced with younger families. Caitlin. I was just going to say, we're having a decline in that 25 to 45 age, you said. And based on what Frank was just saying, it's a nice observation as the state of Maine is having a problem with kids who go off to college and then don't come back because there's no jobs. I think we should maybe look into why kids who went off to college aren't coming back home. I mean, just, it's, you know, the economy is the blame for everything. <laughs> and thank you. And you do have in your handout a lot more data, and not only to that point, of how Cape compares with the U.S., with the state of Maine, with the county, and with Cape. There's, there's a chart there that, you know, even to the point of, you know, how many uh, Filipinos live in the state of Maine, Cape Elizabeth. It just goes on, on and on with so many different descriptions based on questions they asked. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, the next item is the review of our minutes from the May 9, 2011 meeting. Do I have a motion? Jessica. I move to approve the minutes of the May 19th, uh, sorry, May 9th meeting. Is there a second? Okay, motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? And I'll be abstained. I'll be abstaining because I wasn't here. Okay. Any other comments or questions? All those in favor of the motion? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, tonight, uh, the first item on the agenda is actually a public hearing scheduled for the local buzz liquor license application. Uh, if anybody would like to uh, speak on that issue, please approach the podium. And I'll now open the public hearing. You'll have uh, three minutes. Just please identify yourself by name and address or affiliation to the town. <clears throat> Sir. Good evening, council members. Jamie Wagner for the local buzz. 
Uh, on Friday of this week, it'll be our one-year anniversary since we've opened, so uh, that's a milestone for us. It's been a wonderful year. We feel that we've been accepted by the community very warmly, and, and we feel uh, reciprocal in that feeling. Um, as the town council is aware, uh, a little over a year ago, you awarded us a beer and wine license, and what we're asking is to supplement that with a spirits license um, going forward. Um, We've had regular requests by our patrons throughout the year to uh, add a spirits license. And what we'd like to do is offer high quality spirits and uh, continue in the tradition of offering local spirits as well. Um, there's a great spirit company out of Freeport uh, called Cold River. They make vodka and gin. And uh, Back River out of Unity, I believe, uh, they make a gin product. Um, with respect to the uh, our background as a liquor license holder. We um, have been exemplary. We've had no trouble with the police whatsoever. Um, we had one, uh, situ uh, not a situation, one um, attempt by the police to send in an underage uh, couple to buy alcohol, and they were refused it uh, after our, uh, one of our servers ID'd them and realized they were underage. Couldn't produce an identification, so they were refused, and the police department sent us a letter, and I think they shared it with the town as well, saying that we, we passed the, the test. So um, We strictly adhere to, to state statutes, and we're very familiar with them on all the liquor laws. I've read them uh, five or six times thoroughly, and have shared them with my staff. Um, there are, as you know, there's other entities in Cape that have spirits licenses as well. So um, I respectfully request that the town council grant our request, and then we pass along to the state for further processing. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. All right. Thank you, Jamie. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, would anybody else like to speak to this issue? Okay, I'll now close the public hearing. Uh, do I have a motion? Uh, Sarah. I move we approve the request of the local buzz for a malt, venice, and spirit license. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any comments, questions? All those in favor of the motion? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, item number 99-2011 is the good table is applying for a renewal of its malt, venice, and spirituous license Actually, there is an opportunity for public comment if anybody would like to comment on the Good Tables license. Seeing none, do I have a motion? Sarah. I move we renew the uh, Good Tables Malt, Venice, and Spirit license. Second. A motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, item number 95-2011 is the Town Center Plan Update and Map. This was tabled from our meeting of May 9th. Uh, and at this point, I would ask uh, Councillor Sullivan to update the council. Thank you. Oh, do we need, oh, sorry. Uh, the town manager reminded me we need a motion to take this off the table. Uh, do I have a so, motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor? All right, thank you. Okay, Jessica. Yes, um, this was actually a 2010 council goal and basically just an update of the status of the town center district since its inception in 1993. So I'll, I'll just read for the uh, listening audience and those here the, a br the brief history of, of this. And then if uh, the chairman thinks I ought to, I could just point out some things on the, the larger map that's um, over by the podium. In 1993, the Cape Elizabeth Town Council created the Town Center Planning Committee, which represented various members of the Cape Elizabeth community. The committee developed a town center vision and goals and included 37 specific recommendations, which would, in time, and as funding were to become available, provide both short-term and long-term planning. The 1993 goals and recommendations are, well, they're in the packets. So they're some of the back of the the uh, room uh, are in bold and, I, and there's I've written the current status of each one below there are, anyway there are 37 different recommendations what I, I first of all I want to thank um, 
Maureen O'Meara, the town planner, for helping me with this. And I thought that basically what I would do is just um, go through each of the 37, original 37 recommendations and report on whether they had been done or addressed or not and why. Um, and then I, I thought it would be a good idea just to, to update the town center map. And so if, with the chairman's permission, I'll, should I go sure. over and point uh, out there, or do you think? Um, I, I, mean, it's a, I mean, I think we've all had an opportunity to read through this, and I know you're trying to do this for the benefit of uh, the public, both here and on TV, but I'm, there's 37 is a pretty big number. No, I, I'm not, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not planning on go, going through the individual recommendations. Oh. I'm sorry if I... I misunderstood you. I was, sorry about that. No, I just thought I'd point out the that would map. Be, that would That's be great. all. Yeah, please do so. I mean, if anyone has any specific questions, I'd certainly be happy to answer. <laughs> all right, phew. Thank you. <laughs> Can you hear me? I think that should pick you up. The, the microphone should pick you up, Jessica. Okay. okay. Well, the, the councils have a, an 11 by 17 in front of them, but for those of you here, the town center district is in lavender. And the bold blue lines um, outline what is currently town-owned property. Uh, this dark lavender section is the town center uh, core subdistrict, which was separated a little bit because it has some very, lots of little building, it's very compact, and so the committee at the time felt it deserved a little special definition. Um, the, the town center plan um, in 1993 dealt a lot with sidewalks, and so I thought it would be a good idea to point out what was planned and what was actually built. And so um, what you'll see is a green, green line, sidewalk lines, and orange sidewalk lines. What is, what is orange has not been created. What is green has been created. So what you see that is green is existing sidewalk, and these sections of orange, there is no sidewalk. And so ultimately my recommendation uh, to the town council as a result of uh, doing this uh, updated report is to perhaps recommend to the council at their, at their pleasure uh, consideration of a workshop to determine whether or not they think that any of the, uh, any of the uh, recommendations from 1993 that weren't done deserve uh, merit or any further action. So basically it's just here's where we are today from the original 1993 plan. So, any questions? Does anybody on the council have any questions? I do. Uh, go ahead, Sarah. So when you say sidewalk, does that mean it includes the, I forget the name of the green strip with the trees and the? The esplanade? Yes, thank you. So in each of these orange where you're recommending, would that be just merely putting in a sidewalk or would it be the whole kit and caboodle? I think it's just merely sidewalk because a lot of the original center design with esplanades and so forth was ultimately not accepted. So my understanding is this is basic sidewalk and, and with probably basic landscaping along with it. Because in 1993, they, they, they created several scenarios of design, but they were ultimately not ever implemented. And that, that could be a conversation for another day. I, I thought that town center standards encouraged, if not required, an esplanade between the sidewalk and the roadway. And that doesn't mean with necessarily with trees and light fixtures, but for, for safety purposes. But I, I agree with you, Jessica. I think it would be helpful for the council to uh, put this issue to a workshop in the future, and we could evaluate whether we ought to move forward with any of these recommendations that haven't been implemented. Um, so uh, unless there are other questions, I'm wondering if there's a motion, unless people disagree with me. <laughs> Jim? I move that we accept the Town Center Plan 2011 review update as presented by Councilor Sullivan and take uh, her recommendation to, um, to consider or to, to plan for a workshop to discuss those recommendations that have not been implemented and determine 
what merit they might have in consideration for further action on behalf of the town. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Sarah. Just to thank Jessica for all the work that must have gone into these recommendations. And as well as the town planner, uh, this definitely appears to have been the result of a lot of hard work. So thank you. You're welcome. Uh, all those in favor of the motion? Thank you. Uh, item number 100-2011 is a bond refinancing. It, it might be helpful if the town manager is willing to just summarize what this item is about, and why we're doing it. Why don't I do two? Is it okay if I do two of them? Uh, explain at the same time. Sure. Okay. The uh, items number one hundred and one hundred and one uh, both involved uh, bonds of long-term borrowing. Back in two thousand one, for a number of projects, uh, the town borrowed about four million dollars. Uh, half, roughly half of that been paid back, all but one point nine one million. Uh, when those funds were borrowed for the next 10 years, the interest rates back then were much higher than they are today. They were, they were uh, about 4.5%. Uh, we now have an opportunity to pay back that loan as much as one would re refinance a home and do so for a lower interest rate. Uh, the lower interest rate averages out over the next 10 years, the estimate is 2.5%, uh, 2.55%. Uh, so therefore, as a result of that refinancing, after you look at the, the cost of the refinancing, the, the, the printing of the official statements and the different fees that you need to pay, we save about uh, 220 to 240000 dependent upon what the interest rate is when you actually obtain the bids. Uh, right now, interest rates are still uh, very advantageous for borrowing municipal bonds, so we we expect to fully realize the savings that, that I've just mentioned. Uh, that's item number 100. It, it simply saves us interest costs over the next 10 years of 220 to 240,000. Uh, the next item uh, would borrow in a, in a very general way, very general language, uh, $200,000 uh, for land acquisition. Uh, the bond resolution does not specifically indicate for what purpose other than for land acquisition. Uh, the reason being is even though there's a later item which proposes that might be spent for a certain item, uh, for a certain program, if, if that didn't happen for some reason, uh, you know, relating to the purchase sale agreement wasn't uh, actualized, fundraising and other places fell short, uh, we would still have borrowed the 200000 but we, we would we would still hold hold it. This this to borrow this extra two hundred thousand cost about two hundred and forty thousand. Uh, if you, you if you really added all the fees and apportioned it out over the, the next ten years, there's actually in the materials I gave you there's a uh, there's a uh, listing that shows that it would be paid back uh, between now and April fifteenth, twenty twenty one, and the the interest cost would be $27,143 uh, for that. But there are some other fees that go along with it that it, it adds up to about $240. Uh, anyway, those are those two items. One of them uh, saves around $240,000, and the other, one, it take, the other one takes that savings and applies it towards uh, future land acquisition needs. All right. Thank you, Mike. I think it might be uh, make the most sense to deal with item 100 separately uh, in, in accordance with how it appears on the agenda. So would anybody like to make a motion? Ann? Oh. Oh. Uh, sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, you're right. Is this, this would be the opportunity if somebody would make a, make a public comment on item 100. This is the section of the bond refinance that relates to the existing bond refinance, the $1.9 million, not the land acquisition portion, which is on the next agenda item. So if anybody would like to speak to this item, you're certainly welcome to do so. I see none. Uh, thank you, Frank. Uh, Ann? Um, yes, Mr. Chair, I'd, I'd like to move. I don't think we have to read the whole page and a third of this, but I would like to move 
that the Council authorize the issuance of up to $1.91 million of general obligation refunding bonds uh, in order to save money, as laid out in, this, in the text before us under item 100 dash Seconded. The motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Yeah. I, I would just like to commend the manager and um, Joe Quitera, Quitera um, for working this out. It's a great way to save money for the, munis the municipality and for the citizens. Okay. Any other comments? All right. All those in favor of the motion? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we are next turning Mr. to... Uh, Mr. Yes. Mr. Chair, could I... Um, I don't know if I need to make a formal motion, but, well, yes, I probably do. Uh, I'd like to make two motions, in fact, but the first motion would be to take item 102 out of order. In other words, to take 102 first and then 101 um, for purposes of uh, easier discussion. Okay, and item 102, just for those who may not have oh, the Oh, I'm event. sorry, Friday yes. Go ahead. Uh, item 102 is the proposed partnership with Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. It's laid out in our packet on page 4. It, it has to do with the Robinson Woods acquisition. And then item And 101. item 101 is the bond res a bond resolution which authorizes expenditure of up to 200000 for land acquisition. So it seems to me that it would be easier to discuss the ac land acquisition first and then to talk about any potential borrowing to fund such an acquisition second. So that's a motion? Yeah, yeah <laughs> sort of. Yes, I'd like to, my motion is to take 102 uh, out of order before 101. Okay. And then I do have a second motion in a minute. Sure. The motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. All right, thank you. Any Questions or discussion? This, oh, I'm sorry, Caitlin. Just that if we do 102 first, 102 refers to 101, so would we have had to pass 101 in order to pass 102 because it refers to 102, 101? It's happening? I think we'll be able to correct that in the way we word the motion. Just wanted to make but sure. Good catch. No, I think that's a good point, and I, I think I understand the rationale, which is we're sort of approving the overall concept and then the, the two hundred thousand dollar portion is what is item one oh one. So it sort of makes sense to get to that second. So I'll I'll vote it's, in favor it's of a funding mechanism. Right. Any any other questions? The only comment I'd make is the kind of to emphasize the point Mike made, which is this additional two hundred thousand dollars is a uh, terminology in general. We expect it would be applied to this, but it can be applied to any land hmm. and the land acquisition. So there's no confusion about that. Right. No, that's a good point. So we have this uh, Basically a procedural motion. All those in favor? Okay. And, then and you had a second motion? Yes, I had a second motion. My second motion is that since we're now on item 102, coming up on item 102, um, I would like to move that the council uh, go for a short time into executive session to discuss land acquisition matters per whatever the main statute is. I don't have the numbers, but Mike assured me we could fill in the numbers. It's uh, yeah. Title One, Section 406, uh, 405, it's either B, C, or D. I'll, I'll have to look at it. <laughs> and it like it, he said. Okay, so that you've made the motion. Yes. We don't, I don't know if we have a second yet. Is there a second? Just a second. All right. Any questions or comments, Sarah? Uh, do we want to hear from the public now, before executive session, or after? That's a, it, it, I was going to raise the same question. I, I, I anticipate the executive session would be fairly brief, brief. 10 I, to 15 it, minutes tops. Oh, I hope <clears throat> okay. shorter than that. Okay. So uh, I, th I guess I'd rather, well, I, what, are, what does the rest of the council think? It's. Go ahead, Ann. I would prefer to have a sense, of, to make sure all the council has a sense of the land acquisition issues so that then when we hear the public con uh, comments, 
we will have a context in which to place them. It's difficult to talk about land acquisition issues that we want to discuss in executive session when we're not in executive session. So that's what I'd prefer. But So long as we all take a solemn vow that we'll be out here in 10 minutes, I'd prefer to do the executive session first. Uh, but there are people here I know who want to speak, so I want to just be sure we get back out here fairly quickly so we don't keep them waiting too long. Me too. Okay. Is that all right? Mike? I, I just have a procedural question just to be sure that it, it may be through you to, to the person making the motion. Uh, obviously, the council can enter executive session for matters discussing land acquisition disposition. Is the reason you want to discuss this in executive session because public disclosure of perhaps a negotiating position yes. of the town might harm a point in negotiation or discussions? Yes. Is it something like that? Yes. Uh, isn't that per, and that per, would be appropriate per the, the, the rules appropriate to the statute? Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that clarification, Mike, Michael. Have we, we haven't voted on this motion yet, have we? No, we haven't. All right. No. Gosh, I'm sorry. Uh, all those in favor of the motion? Okay. Carries unanimously. We will take a 10 minute executive session. I apologize for the people who are here, but we will do our best to get back out here promptly. Sorry.
return to the public session. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? And this is where I say thank you all for your patience, though. You didn't really have a whole lot of choice, but I do apologize uh, for uh, us being in an executive session longer than we had hoped. Um, so at this point, uh, we are on item number 102-2011. Uh, and uh, do I have a motion? Oh, thank you. So much for our uh, uh, award on uh, public participation <laughs> in meetings. Uh, for yourself. I've now had to be reminded twice uh, to allow for that. Uh, we don't have a public hearing schedule, but this item is on the agenda. So uh, we do allow for a total of 15 minutes of public comment on the proposed partnership with the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. Uh, I see there are a lot of people here. We'll do our best to hear from as many folks as possible. If you're interested in speaking, please come to the podium uh, and limit your comments to three minutes. Uh, please identify yourself by name and address or affiliation to the town of Cape Elizabeth. So if, if anybody would like to speak, we would welcome your comments. And if there are others who are planning to speak, if you'd be willing to line up behind this gentleman, that would save some time so we don't use up all of our 15 minutes. Okay. Hi, I'm Bill Enman. I live at 58 Spring Avenue. Uh, I'm one of the elder group. Uh, I just don't understand when you people are talking of giving out $350,000 uh, for this, and yet you're scrimping and saving here and there. Uh, one of the items is the next item to come up after this whole thing is over, to, to pick up $35,000. But here you go, blink of an eye, $350,000. You have all these different uh, items that you're taking out of the tax roll. No wonder people's taxes are going up. All their property is being put into this, this land trust. The more money that goes in that land trust, the higher our taxes go. And I don't think it's right. I'm not going to use this land, and I bet 90% of the people in the town will. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Would anybody else like to speak on this issue? Yes, Chris. Good evening. Uh, Chris Franklin, Executive Director of the Cape with Land Trust. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, I really see tonight as a historic opportunity to continue a partnership with the town of Cape Elizabeth and putting forward uh, recreational goals and, and uh, conservation goals. Uh, the town has done an incredible job of uh, setting aside land for its residents and the land trust has played a role in that as well. Um, I'm not sure everybody knows, but the creation of the Spur Rink Bridge, uh, the Great Pond Walkway, the trails out at Gullcrest are all done by the town. There's a, an incredible amount of work done by the town, and the land trust has partnered with the town uh, to preserve land at Great Pond and the trails around Great Pond, uh, the preservation of Jordan Farm, and the <coughs> preservation of the initial uh, 82 acres at Robinson Woods, which uh, it's hard to go by that parking lot and not see people at this property. Um, we have an opportunity uh, with as the land trust to acquire this property and we're here tonight uh, to ask you to consider uh, a pledge towards that project. Um, the land trust, when we were formed in 1985, there were about a dozen land trusts in Maine, now there's about a hundred. Um, and the public-private partnership that land trusts bring are what make these conservation deals affordable, um, that the acquisition amount that the town is being asked to uh, consider tonight is, is one third of the, the acquisition price. And uh, so we're glad to be able to partner with you because this property has been identified um, as a goal for preservation by the town. And through the public opinion surveys done by the town, by the Greenbelt Master Plan, by the Comprehensive Plan, it's, it's very clear that the town has an interest in partnering with the land trust. And so um, we're glad to be able to bring this forward. Uh, the, one of the intriguing parts of this uh, project that many of you already know is that 
Back in 1974, the idea of a crosstown trail linking Fort Williams with Kettle Cove was envisioned, and now some 30 years later, uh, we're close to knitting together that seven and a half mile trail. And this acquisition preserves a full 70% of that trail that remains in private ownership. And as we know, the only way to ensure future public access is through public ownership. We've been very fortunate to have a landowner that's allowed us access over the years and we're very fortunate for the many private landowners who enable people to use their lands. Um, but I really feel that few decisions that this council can make, that this town can make, that will be looked at 25, 50, even 100 years from now, will have the type of lasting impact as acquisition, acquisition such as this, that the preservation of those select places in Cape Elizabeth is really uh, a gift for future generations. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Chris. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I'm Jim Schaefer. I'm one of the users of, of that land right now. I live at 650 Shore Road. I run there almost every day with our dog. And it's rare that I don't see other cars there. I don't meet uh, other people uh, you know, with their dogs. I see this as an integral part of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, and I'm aware, well aware that part of it is Robinson Woods and part of it is the Robinson property. And I've talked to Tim Robinson several times about his view of the control of the property. I even offered to clear fallen trees and so forth. He wasn't sure about that, insurance issues and so forth. But I would be an active volunteer in working on that extra 63 uh, acre uh, project. But I'd say this, do the math. $350,000, 63 acres, that's $5,500 an acre. You'd be tying up land for all time in the future for a cost of only $5,500 an acre. So, um, I mean, that property is a major part of my life at Cape Elizabeth, and it seems to me you would be establishing that for long term uh, at a very reasonable price. So I would encourage you to go ahead with the purchase. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Ogden Williams. I live at uh, 5 Beach Bluff Terrace in Cape Elizabeth. I just wanted to briefly speak in favor of uh, <clears throat> the town uh, supporting the uh, taking this land uh, at Robinson Woods uh, for public use. I think the, uh, the land, I, I, there's hardly a day goes by where I don't bless the name of the town of Cape Elizabeth and the Land Trust for just all the wonderful uh, trails and, and land, uh, the different parcels that uh, to me are really what make Cape Elizabeth uh, the place I want to live. I mean, basically, that's kind of my number one uh, thing that I think makes us special is just the, the wonderful uh, sense of uh, rural land that we still keep. Uh, to me, uh, taking uh, the land trust, uh, taking over the original uh, Robinson Woods was a magnificent success. And I think this other parcel of land is really, really magical and uh, <clears throat> just goes uh, perfectly like two jigsaw puzzle pieces together. It really uh, goes perfectly along with this, uh, the land that already exists, uh, the trail system that's already there. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Hi, my name is Ingrid Strassinger. I uh, am a resident of the town and I also teach fourth grade at Pond Cove. I've been there for a number of years and I would like to share with you uh, some things that you may or may not know that go on between the school and the land trust. Um, for several years now, the uh, land trust education committee has partnered with the schools to provide programming for students, connecting concepts taught in the classroom to field work on uh, self-preserved property particularly in Robinson Woods. From the beginning, I've experienced firsthand the powerful effect this community partnership has had on both student learning and environmental stewardship. As part of the fourth grade science curriculum, students learn about topics in ecology, particularly forest ecology. In the classroom, we explore life cycles of marine, of Maine forest plants and animals, such topics as the water cycle, adaptations that enable organisms to survive in the Maine forest habitat, food chains and food webs, and the interdependence of organisms in an environment and human impacts on the environment. 
While the classroom provides one means of delivering that instruction, it is in the field that this learning springs to life and becomes much more meaningful to our students. Over the course of a school year, all fourth grade classes, and that's usually about 150 students, take three educational walks on the same path in Robinson Woods, and that's, usually on the, that's always been on the Wildflower Trail. So we go once in the fall, once in the winter, and once in the spring. From the moment the kids set foot on the property, they're actively engaged in activities. The air is abuzz with excitement as trees and plants are identified, animals are spotted, tracks and sign of animal activity are discovered in the winter, salamander eggs are found in the vernal pool in the spring, learning games are played, and observations recorded. This program would not be possible without the direct involvement and leadership of, of CELT. Prior to their, to their acquisition of the property, we would take our students once a year to Maine Audubon and Falmouth. Uh, this cost a fair amount of money, which is why we went only once. We needed to pay for bus transportation, and we needed to pay an admission fee. It seemed a shame to travel 30 minutes uh, to uh, a place to do that when we had our own uh, lots of wonderful outdoor places right in our own backyard. Uh, when the Land Trust approached us about creating a partnership, we were thrilled to be able to show kids what they could be, fa could be found in their own backyard. This comes at no cost to the school. And as part of the program, each student is provided with a uh, Robinson Woods Nature Journal. In this, there are activities that we do before each walk in the classroom. The students take these on the walks, and then there are post activities back in the classroom. In addition, CELT provides field guides, binoculars, books, teaching guides, and digital media to the school through an educational resource center housed in the elementary school and available to all of the district schools. For many of the students, the Fall Robinson Woods Walk marks their first time on the property and they are excited that such a place exists in their own backyard. After each and every trip, uh, the students board the bus talking about how much fun they had and many are making plans for bringing their parents back so that they can get a closer look and maybe hear some of the birds that were scared away by all of us traipsing around the property that they were hoping to see. Uh, Ingrid, uh, if you could just... Yes, run. so it's a powerful impact on the students uh, for their uh, learning when you can involve them and bring them onto the property and out of the classroom. Uh, they are much more engaged and the learning is much more memorable and sticks with the children a lot longer. So I would uh, envision that adding another piece to the property would give us more opportunities to expand what's being done with students, perhaps uh, maybe through a pond ecosystem project in another grade. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Would anybody else like to speak on this issue? Okay, I'll now uh, then close the public comment. So this is item number 102, which is the proposed partnership with the Land Trust. Uh, would anybody like to take a stab at a motion? Well, do we have to correct the language, David? Right, and I, I, well, before we, yeah, that's a good question. Before we get there, uh, would the council like to first move the question regarding the $150,000 that's currently in the land acquisition fund and then take up the $200,000, which would be the bond portion separately. And I'll make a motion since everyone else is shy. Um, I would like to, uh, it's going to be sort of long-winded, so hopefully we'll clean up the language. I would like to move that the council allocates $150,000 from the current land acquisition fund and also allocates $200,000 from a proposed bond that we hope to authorize under uh, item 101. Uh, and I would also, and, and then there's all this stuff about placing it in account and all that kind of stuff. I would also um, like to uh, respectfully request uh, CELT's commitment to work together with the town to explore uh, another issue about uh, the shore road path, whether it could be or should be moved inland in Robinson Woods 1, not this section, but what we currently call Robinson Woods, uh, because, and I can speak to this, uh, my reasons for this in a minute, but that's my motion. And, and so the, well, there's been a motion. So the motion is for the 150 150,000 from the land acquisition fund, 200,000 from a, assuming we approve, 
the bond uh, author 200,000 bond authorized uh, in item 101 which we're going to deal with in a few minutes and then I just have an, an amendment to it which is to respect or an addition to it which is to work together with the for the, the the land trust to work together with the town to explore alternatives for the shore road path being moved inland. Okay. And in order to save money and avoid uh, construction right along the shore road path. And your motion is also including the, the rest of the proposed language uh, in our draft materials that the, we would. Yes, yes. There's uh, the funds to be placed in an account committed for a partnership with CELT uh, for CELT's planned acquisition of 63 plus or minus acres of land known as Robinson Woods II. Uh, the total, I'll just read it, the total municipal donation of 350,000, assuming we approve, approve the 200, uh, may be expended by the town manager at the time the property is acquired, provided that the town of Cape Elizabeth receives a public access easement in a form acceptable to the town attorney and provided that all other funds needed by CELT for the acquisition are obtained. If the property is not acquired in conformance with the May 2011 purchase and sale agreement between CELT and the Robinson Family LLC, the $350,000 uh, shall become unassigned within the town of Cape Elizabeth land acquisition fund. In other words, it would revert to the land acquisition fund. Okay, thank you. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Yeah. If I could just, it, it was too long to put in a motion, but um, I, I think this project is a good thing. I, I understand people's concern about spending money, but I, I do think this is, uh, if CELT can make this happen, along with the town, along with private uh, contributors, and along with the Maine Coast, Heritage Foundation, if I haven't mangled their name, I think it will be a wonderful thing. And I encourage people to contribute to this proposal um, as CELT raises more money for it. Um, but there is, in my mind, not just one project involved here. Uh, I think we have an opportunity for a win-win solution uh, on two issues of importance to the town. First, uh, the Robinson Woods Two piece, which would provide a key link for the green belt and some beautiful open space, a lot of beautiful open space, to be preserved for <coughs> public use forever. That's a fantastic thing. I also think, however, there's a second um, piece to this, which is that maybe we could save the taxpayers up to about $75,000 in construction costs and avoid some significant changes to the character of Shore Road. Um, and for that reason, if the path were to be moved inland um, and not be right along Shore Road as it is currently planned to be. I don't know if this is feasible or not, but I think it's worth exploring and I think in partnership with CELT we can see if we could possibly do this. It would save a lot of money for the town, potentially, we don't know for sure. Um, and if we could work together to do it, we'd have beautiful land in Robinson Woods too and we'd save some construction costs for the taxpayers, some significant construction costs for the taxpayers by moving the path inland, which would be cheaper. Okay. So that's why I made that motion. And just to be clear, though, that's a... a it's a, re re a respectful re request to work together. Okay, exactly. So it's, okay. Uh, not, not the donation part, but the, the, the working, the cell and town working together thing. On the location of the, on the location of the shore road path, whether it should go inland or not. Okay, thank you. Any other comments, questions? Sarah? I just wanted to very quickly respond to the speaker who said that he felt 99% of the people wouldn't use the land. Um, I walk there frequently with my dog, and I can attest that many, many, many people are there whenever I'm there, and that's just 45 minutes a day, so I assume the rest of the day is as filled with um, activities as varied as you can imagine. Obviously, there's a million dog walkers. There's also joggers who go at a pace that's, that's impressive. Um, trail bikers more and more, particularly on weekends, large contingents of them covered in mud. Um, families with very, very young children, toddlers, obviously gleeful at being outdoors and exploring um, nature. Students 
as Ingrid has said, um, come in droves and also after school to play and bike. I see many retired folks strolling, bird watching, um, photographers, painters sitting by the waterfall painting. Um, not uncommonly in the summer, you see kids actually playing in that waterfall and in the pond next to it, um, having a blast, actually swimming. <laughs> There's a lot of um, nature watching, obviously, with all the birds and waterfowl and um, animals that are in the pond. And I could go on and on. The winter, there's cross-country skiing. Um, after a blizzard, you go in there the very next morning, and you see people skiing, snowshoeing, playing, building snowmen, and blah, 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 blah. So I would, I guess, I also drive frequently down that dirt road. And I don't think I've ever driven down without having to stop five or six times for all the children and dogs who are coming up the road to get on the path. So I walk in the outer loop, which is the current Robinson Woods, and I can tell you that more people are on the other side in the land that we're, we're discussing now because it comes right down from 77. So I will stop talking just to say that I think this is, will be heavily, heavily used by the town. I think it's an incredible resource, and study after study shows that um, emotional health and well-being is, is greatly increased by um, human beings' immersion in and participation with nature. So I will be enthusiastically supporting, and I think it's a great use of our, our tax dollars. Mike, you just had a brief comment? Yeah, actually, I wanted to have a brief colloquy with Councillor Swift-K to be sure that staff understands the intent of the motion. Okay. Through the chair. It, it, it's my understanding that you're binding us from this point forward to have a discussion with the land trust and with other interested parties as to the good and bad points of moving a portion of the shore road path a little bit inland onto the Robinson Woods property. That's it's Robinson, binding to have that discussion. Robinson Woods. Robinson one, Woods. One. One property. I did not hear that the outcome of those discussions that, you, that the motion binds the action in any way. Did I hear correctly? No, there is no contingency. You mean for the don donation? Yes. You, 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 no the, the request no is simply to have a respectful discussion. <clears throat> yes. To see if there can be a win-win with both parties. Yes, it's my hope that there can and be a win-win. But I don't think I have all the facts, at least at this point, to know whether this is feasible, whether it makes financial sense, whether it's legal under their easements, whatever, to move the path in. And continually, continuing the colloquy, what is your expectation of a report back to the council? I can't say that I had a, a firm expectation. I expected that staff would report back to us. Are you looking for a deadline or something? It was just it was an open-ended question. I'm open just to making suggestions. sure I understand what we're supposed to do. I'm open to suggestions from the rest of the council. I would like to see it happen sooner rather than later. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would think that within the next few weeks, the discussions could have been had. And if it looks like it's going to be Re fruitful. Report at the next, uh, report well, back on the conversation at the next council meeting. Is that what you like? Sure. Okay. And just to be clear, the, the outcome will not affect if the council does vote in favor, this motion will not affect the funding for this land acquisition. It's just a, it's a, a, a it's request. A, it's a good faith request that we work, we, the town, and we, CELT, work together to, you know, see if it's possible and to see if we could save the citizens some money and save the, save the town maybe having some construction right along the side of Shore Road for us uh, about a quarter mile. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Uh, Jessica. Yeah, I, you know, I've been, um, I've, I've responded to many emails and I've been struggling with this issue. Um, I am, I think it's a very exciting prospect and I'm, I'm all for it in, in concept because it does almost link the Greenbelt, not quite, but almost links our Greenbelt Trail. I'm very much in favor of of uh, spending the $150,000 we have in our land acquisition fund for this. You know, I'm, I'm worried about the $200,000 uh, borrowing because I just don't like to add more to the town debt. And, and in that light, I'm very supportive of, of, of Councillor Swift-Kayata's 
um, thoughts on trying to, can, you know, to stimulate discussion with the land trust on this possibility of moving the shore road path inward because it could potentially save $75,000 or more. Um, I've, I initially vote, I mean, I ultimately voted in favor of the path because it's going through and I want it to be successful, but one of the things that I didn't like about it was that it, that, that section will drastically alter um, the rural um, um, look of Shore Road and the possibility of moving that inward um, would keep a lot of that road characteristic as well as save the town significant money. And, um, and I, I would be delighted to to see those discussions take place because I do agree it could be a win-win for everyone. Um, and again, um, I, I'm very much in favor of open space, but what, what always you know, comes back to me is that we are spending taxpayer money. And the land trust has, does a wonderful job of raising money, but we have to remember that, that those monies are, are, are voluntarily donated by people. And it's wonderful. I'm a donator myself. But when we, we add to town debt, we then require funds to be paid by our citizens, and they don't have a, they don't have a say. It's what, what we decide here takes money out of their pocket, and I, I always try to remember that. Um, although I, I do think this is a very important link um, and um, helps preserve it. I would like to mention that most of this particular property is already um, has is protected habitat RP1 and RP2 wetlands and so I would like to point out that the town has has done a lot of excellent diligence with that but I, I do think this is a wonderful opportunity thank you Frank this is a, lot, a brief comment in, in support of this I think it's an excellent opportunity for the town I hate to use the term once in a lifetime but if it's <clears throat> once we secure this property into the land trust uh, and through this through this proposal it's permanently protected, which creates a value for all of us in town uh, into perpetuity, uh, which ultimately accrues to the value of all of our properties and, and into our own personal wealth one way or another. Um, there's a time to spend and a time to save, my mother used to say, and I think this is the time for the town to spend uh, $350,000 on a property that's worth multiples of that. Thank you. Jim? Again, just to mirror what other people have had to say about uh, this is really creating quite a legacy, I think. Um, this is an incredible piece of property and a great opportunity and one that I think I want to thank you, David, and also Frank for leading the council through our deliberations on this over the last several months and getting us up to speed. And I just want to concur with what um, those of us that are shy up here appreciate in um, bringing forward um, the request to to work in good faith and uh, I just uh, again I think this everything we're doing here tonight is is good faith it's good faith on the part of the town and on its leadership on the manager and others and I would just expect that the self would sit with us and have a frank discussion about the possibilities again that's all we're asking for it's not connected in a contingency uh, long and short of it is uh, again um, when you run for election and you have the privilege to serve the citizens of Cape Elizabeth and an opportunity like this comes along, um, I'm very proud to be part of the people that are voting for it because I think for, for the generations that will come, this is going to be an incredible piece of real estate. Kayla. Just so I'm not the only one up here not to make a comment, um, I also am in great support of the act acquisition of this land. Um, I wanted to thank all the people that sent us emails in, in voicing their opinion, so it made making this decision much easier. Um, also, I want to echo the comments of Councillor Sullivan and Anne Swift Kayata that we are requesting that the land trust enter into these talks. And while they point out the great thing of saving all this money, and saving money is always great, to me, saving the rural character of what Shore Road looks like is almost worth a little bit more than saving all that money. So I greatly encourage CELT to, you know, step up and, and take on these talks in a serious tone, if you don't mind. Thank you. 
I guess I have the last word. Um, I, this is a real watershed moment for the town of Cape Elizabeth, and I really want to thank the uh, folks from the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust who've worked hard to bring this opportunity to the council and to the town at large. I think when we look back at this decision 10, 20 years from now, we're going to be so grateful that I hope the vote goes away. It looks like it's going. We're going to be so grateful that we decided to partner with the land trust to preserve this property. Uh, preservation of open space, our natural environment, is a top goal of our citizens. Uh, survey after survey, it's in the comprehensive plan. Um, it's, uh, it's a vision for our town uh, to uh, preserve land like this. So I am very, very excited to vote in favor of this motion. And at this point, I think I'll call the question and ask for a vote on, on the motion before the council. All those in favor? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, before I forget, we actually do need to go backwards on the agenda to item number 101, which is the bond resolution for the land acquisition to authorize the expenditure of $200,000 for land acquisition to preserve open space. Uh, is there a motion? Yeah. I'd, I'd like to move that the town council vote uh, authorize, excuse me, authorize the expenditure of up to $200,000 for land acquisition to preserve open space and that we authorize the issuance of up to $200,000 in bonds to finance such an expenditure. And I would note, just for those who are watching, this does not mention Robinson Woods in one or two or anything in particular. It is for land acquisition. So um, yeah, I think our expectation is that it would be for Robinson Woods too, given what we just voted on. But uh, I believe some, it, this is all laid out on page three and page four of our agenda. And Mike, am I correct in uh, assuming that if for some reason the deal doesn't go through, this will just revert to the land acquisition fund? The, the, it's provided that the monies go to the land acquisition fund. Yes. They, they, only would, they go in there that might be pushed out at some point if the other action that okay. comes into it. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, we've, we've had a motion that's been made and seconded. Uh, this is technically a separate agenda item. Uh, the two are obviously linked. Um, I, I guess I would ask if, if somebody would like to speak on this issue, uh, I guess just for the benefit of all of us, I, I would ask that if, if it's a, a repeat of what you've already said, we, we, we obviously remember the prior comment, but you are welcome to come to the podium and speak up for three minutes if you would like. Okay, uh, seeing none, uh, any further discussion? Has it been seconded? Uh, we did have a second. Did second did second did Jim, did. thank you, Sarah. Um, I will vote in favor of this motion, just my very quick comment. Uh, pre preserving open space is a, uh, a very important goal for our town, and sometimes it does require the expenditure of public funds. And I, I, again, we heard overwhelmingly positive comments uh, regarding this expenditure, so I am prepared to vote in favor. Okay, all those in favor of the motion? It carries unanimously, thank you. Okay, uh, item number 103-2011, this is a report from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. Um, Jim, would you like to uh, as our town council liaison to the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. Uh, yeah, I thought, uh, I thought would, Bill might be here. Bill asked me to. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, our chair, Bill Nickerson, is not available tonight, but he did ask the town manager to summarize this report, so I would ask Mike to do so. Sorry, Jim, for That's okay. When I talked to Bill, I thought he was coming. Okay. <laughs> I spoke with the staff. Anyway, uh, thanks, thanks, David. Uh, the Fort Williams Advisory Commission was asked to look again at the issue of uh, whether or not uh, buses and other large vehicles uh, ought to be charged fees uh, to enter Fort Williams Park. Uh, they have come forward with a recommendation uh, that tour buses, uh, whether related to a cruise ship or arriving randomly, should be charged $40, and that the trolleys that come on a regular basis uh, or vehicles that come on a regular basis would be charged as a seasonal amount of 1500 for the whole season. Uh, they also said that uh, the recommendation says that uh, camp and rec program buses should not be charged. 
uh, nor should uh, small buses and vans which are operated by elderly care facilities and, and similar type facilities should not be charged. Uh, the recommendation is that this uh, uh, go into effect in 2012. And, and I would note in, in the recommendation they indicated that it would generate revenues of 35860 I'm very nervous about that amount because in, in no way does it reflect any of the cost involved collect, collecting the fee. Uh, so I, uh, you know, I, my, my belief is that this uh, does need a little bit more study and a little bit more work. And I think that the numbers you have before you are, uh, are not uh, complete in terms of uh, both sides of the ledger. Thank you, Mike. Uh, in keeping with our uh, communications policy, if anybody from the public here tonight would like to speak to this issue, we did have a gentleman speak at the beginning of our meeting, and we do remember those comments, sir. Thank you. Uh, if anybody would el else would like to come to the podium, uh, we welcome your comments. Good evening. Peter Eastman of Woodland Road. This is only a point of punctuation. None of you have seen a trolley in the city of Portland or Cape Elizabeth for a long time. As a matter of fact, I don't think I ever did. Uh, but a trolley is a vehicle that has a pole on top that runs along a wire. And I think we could address the situation by simply putting punctuation marks around the term trolley, just in case any legal beagle types uh, get picky. I'm an old editor. And most of the time when I read, I have a red pen in my hand. And uh, so I thought I'd bring that up, just to keep us out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad uh, you're willing to do that. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yes. Good evening, Council. Good evening, Mr. Governor. I'm Jean McGurin, and I'm the owner of the Main Tour Connection, located at 96 Ocean Street in South Portland. My company has been in business for 27 years as a wholesale tour operator for incoming motor coach groups. I have several points I'd like to share with you when it comes to the suggestion of charging motor coaches and trolleys <laughs> um, entrance fees to Fort Williams Park to view one of America's most beloved icons. First of all, it's discriminatory to target motor coach travelers. Why should people who choose to travel as a group in a fuel efficient vehicle be charged versus those who come in as individuals in automobiles, campers, and motorcycles? According to the calculations furnished by your committee, you estimated 784 motor coaches. On average, each motor coach carries 40 passengers. 784 motor coaches times 40 passengers would equal 31,360 automobiles. Does this make economic and ecological sense as we try to search for ways to econom economize on fuel costs, emissions, etc.? It is a clean, quick, and insulated industry that comes rain or shine, leaving dollars in your gift shop and museum. By imposing fees for motor coaches and trolleys, you are also discriminating against a generation of senior and mature travelers. Many of these people have traveled from afar to see the Portland headlight, some of which were stationed here during the war and may have never even seen the ocean before. The negative impact on this fee will be far-reaching. Alternative viewing spots will be utilized and boat operators' viewings will increase, thus Fort Williams losing gift shop and vendor revenues. In the long run, will it really add money to the coffers? How much will it really cost the town of Cape Elizabeth? Portland Headlight plays a major role in the state of Maine's tourism industry as one of the most popular sites to visit, be it by car or motor coach. And I ask the town of Cape Elizabeth to help keep our statewide tourism industry strong and not fragment it by charging such discriminatory fees. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm uh, <clears throat> Michael Foy, and I'm the uh, tour guide coordinator for Intercruises. And Intercruises is the company. We have an office on Commercial Street in Portland. We operate the shore excursions for all of the passengers that come in on the cruise ships in Portland. And we do have many tours all over southern Maine, and they do include, many of them do include, a, a trip over to the Portland Headlight. And I could repeat, but I won't, exactly what this lady said because we agree with her as far as the beauty and the history behind um, the headlight, Portland Headlight in Fort Williams. Intercruises operates 33 days out of the year. One day in June, one day in July, one day in August, 15 in September, 15 in October. We operate when there's a cruise ship. Of course, it varies from year to year, but we're averaging about 34 cruise ships. 
It's a very, very short window of opportunity in which we're operating. During that, those 33 days this year, we have 525 buses that will be coming to that park. So that is a significant number of buses. They're coming there as part of other tours. We, don't, we, we could leave out the ride to Portland Headlight, but we don't want to because of the history and the iconic part of the, of the, the whole scene, the whole site. The trolley, I don't know a lot about the trolley in Portland, the trolley, but the, the one in Portland that says in here, there are three of them, I believe, and I don't know what their season is. Their season, I would imagine, would be somewhere around May 1st to October 31st, somewhere in that area, approximately six months. And I believe they operate every day, most every day. They certainly do in the summer, and on the weekends, they operate probably two and three trips over here a day. So. If you take 180 days times three trolleys over here just once a day, that's 540 trips over here by the trolley. And as this lady said, we carry 40 to 45 passengers on the average. So we're bringing in uh, around 22 to 23,000 people to, to your site. And I would imagine that the trolley probably brings pretty close to the same. I think their capacity is in the 30s with just as many trips. And this fee here, as it's been set up, is $4,500 for the trolleys. Well, if the 784 is an accurate number, we, do, we, we bring in about two-thirds of those buses. The other third comes from New York, Massachusetts, other New England areas, Pennsylvania. I was there the other day and there was a bus from Pennsylvania stopping by. And even the Midwest in the fall. So this is a significant impact on us. You know, you can do the math times the $40, the $40 per bus. It's, it's over $20,000 for our company uh, with this fee. So we're very concerned and have a lot of questions about it. Um, we Sir, did if you could just wrap it up. You're getting to okay. three minutes. Uh, I had some questions that Mike had already mentioned about the collection of the fees, and because we had a discussion last year, we don't. There's going to be significant impact as far as the expenses to collect those fees. Are people going to be notified ahead of time? Are they going to collect them as they come in? There was also discussion about turning the bus around, just come in, don't let the people off, go back out, we don't charge them a fee. And I will, I will also echo what she said about how we, all these people we let off, they go into the museum and to the uh, gift shop and generate a lot of revenue for the, for the town too. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Phil Edmund, 58 Spurlock Avenue. Uh, I was one of those persons that put the little sign on my front yard that said, no fees. I also, and my family, voted for no fees. We didn't stipulate cars, buses, trains, or anything else. We said, no fees. And I think that's what the citizens meant. And to prove that point, if it's necessary, I will go to the street, and I will force a referendum where you people have no option after it passes again. It'll be all done and over with. Most of us in this town are sick and tired of this coming up every year or every other year. This is ridiculous. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of money. Then I have one other question. If you voted to do this tonight, there are vendors that have uh, purchased licenses to be there. If these bus people don't bring their people, that's going to cut their share of profits pretty far. <coughs> Is the town ready to change those, those license fees? Okay. I, we can discuss that when we get to the discussion. Well, okay. No If there are people in this town that want a change in the fort, which I understand is like $10,000 for trees, why don't these people come forward and buy a tree and go plant it? I'm sure it isn't $10,000 to put a tree up, but trees up. I'll volunteer get on with Mike. Mike will go with me and we'll go put a couple of trees up. That's what it takes. but. I think it's ridiculous. I don't know who you hired to put the trees in, but it wasn't a town employee. One other thing I'd like to bring up, just this is not to do with that, it has something to do with what Mike said earlier. 
You people don't understand the uh, firemen in this town. Most of them, or a good percentage of them, aren't even residents of this town. And they ought to get a pat on the back once in a while. They come from South Portland. All young guys. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Would anybody else like to speak on this issue? And, and, and just briefly in response to the last gentleman who spoke, oftentimes when things show up on a, an agenda, you might think necessarily that the council is planning to do something, uh, and that's not necessarily the case. Uh, well, I'm actually opposed to this uh, whole uh, notion for the exact reason you cited, which is we had this sort of vote to keep the fort free, and I'm not sure I'm seeing a difference between somebody on a bus and somebody in their SUV. But putting that all aside, uh, I'm wondering if we're actually ready to move forward on this issue. Uh, and would invite comments. Uh, Anne and then Jim. Oh, I'd like to make a motion. Okay. My, my motion, and then I'd like to comment on it if it gets a second. Um, my motion is that I think this needs to go to a town council workshop because I think we're missing some information that we need. And I'll second that. That's where I was headed with. Yeah. Can I and, and would, and comment? And could, could I make a comment? I um, appreciate the work of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, but I do feel that I need more information before I could uh, make a good determination about whether buses should be charged or not. I'm, and I'm, just to reiterate for whoever's watching, um, I'm concerned about uh, the, the revenues are stated to be almost $36,000, but I don't see any information on expenses. I don't see any information on how to collect the fees, who would collect the fees. Um, I don't see any information about the impact on the shop fees or the impact on the food businesses, the vendors that we have out there. And even though we don't get a cut of their food income, if they don't have any income, I don't think they'll come back next year to pay rent. Um, and also, I remain concerned that I personally do not think it's equitable to have fees uh, for buses when you don't have fees for cars. And I speak as someone who was for fees, parking fees for cars, but I, I can't see why my 86-year-old mother who would come here on a bus, if I drove her in, she'd get to see the fort for free, but if she came on a bus, she'd get charged. Um, it would be built into her price. So I do. I just have a lot of questions and concerns, and those are my reasons why I think we should go to workshop. Jim, did you want to comment? I mean, it, it, Anne's, Anne's put it all into perspective. I, there, there was a meeting when this was originally presented to the manager. The manager pushed back with a lot of the same questions, and clearly it does need a lot more work. Um, the gentleman that spoke about the food vendors that are currently operating there, they're currently operating this year on a test. There's no plan to continue that unless we have a complete deep dive and evaluate how well it went, what were the strengths of the program, what are the opportunities going forward. So if this, this was supposed to be implemented in 2012, so there wasn't going to be an overlap between those two ent enterprises. However, anybody who bid on a license this year certainly took into consideration a lot of the numbers that the tour operators presented to us tonight because they never would have come forward to pay the money that they paid and made the investment they were making in our park without that information. So I think a workshop is the best place to go with this and really get into the detail and understand exactly what it is that we're voting on. Folks generally comfortable with a workshop? Okay. Uh, uh, Mike? I just want to clarify. If you do have a workshop probably in September and it probably will foreclose this being implemented in, in 2012. That's okay Simply with me. The advance notice that That's okay with me because I think it's best to plan these things out carefully ahead of time as we tried to do with the vendor issue um, and make sure we do it right rather than rush into something and do it wrong and have a bunch of unanticipated consequences. Aren't we having a workshop in the summer? In when? The summer. Uh, I'm not. You are no, I don't want one. I just thought, Dave, Dave, tell me what happened. <laughs> Sarah's going to hold one. I would track that. I, I guess um, part of my mo if I could amend my own motion, it would be to have a workshop to be scheduled uh, at the convenience of the council. 
Okay. That's fair. Would you accept that? Second. Okay. Uh, I do see a gentleman's hand up. We did not use our full 15 minutes. Uh, I'm inclined just to allow him. To, uh, you spoke at the beginning, right, sir? Oh, you want to remind you people, I've listened to you talk tonight, and not a single one of you have mentioned what the citizens wanted in this town and what they voted. I hope you don't forget the other people that you should be thinking of. It goes along with what you're talking about. But you're not even mentioning what the citizens want. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, well, I thought I did mention something about the, 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 the keep it free vote. That's something I am taking into account. I actually disagreed with that vote personally, but I understand that that was the vote, and that's why I oppose right now, anyway, fees for buses. But I want to call the question uh, at oh, this point. If, if yeah. I could just correct the record, however, I believe I did mention the, uh, the vote for fees right. in my comments and that the vote was against all fees. So okay. just I, to correct I, I, the record. No, I, thank you. And I, I didn't mean to say that I was No, no, no. I, I'm yeah. not correcting you. Okay. Thank you. I, I, we're going to just uh, cease with any public comments. So at this point, we have a motion to forward this to a town council workshop to be scheduled at the, at the convenience of the council. Just I second that. Okay. And I think it was made and seconded. It was seconded. Okay. It was. Okay. All right. Thank you. All those in favor of the motion? All right, the motion does carry. Thank you. Um, item 104-2011, Ordinance Committee Growth Areas Recommendation. Uh, this is a fairly lengthy uh, part of our agenda. Uh, Jim, as chair of the Ordinance Committee, uh, would you like to try to walk us through this. And, and I guess my only suggestion is maybe we vote on these things separately, the three bullet points. That, that might be the easiest approach. Uh, if, the, that, if the chair would like that to happen, that's fine. Um, uh, just as a matter of uh, background, the town council um, gave a charge, which is uh, been, um, you actually got a chance to see what the charge was. And we had six meetings um, that lasted anywhere up to Two, two and a half hours. We had a lot of public uh, participation and uh, a lot of folks uh, came to these meetings um, to discuss the whole issue of growth areas. We, um, with, the, with the help of, of um, staff, we, um, we got into the detail, all of the comprehensive planning detail as well as current articles across the country, other, other towns and cities in different parts of the country who have addressed the question of growth. And uh, we spent quite a bit of time doing that. And in terms of trying to get to a place where we're um, able to make a recommendation, we, um, we, we came to a, a vote of areas of agreement so as to try to get to a place where we could present something to the council for action. And you see in front of you statements of agreement, whether you, um, whether you agree or don't agree with these, this is a way for us to get to some consensus around the whole question of growth. And any place you notice an IBIT, there, uh, there is a, um, there's a document that was submitted and reviewed by the Ordinance Committee to support is an example the first item was not all development is sprawl. What is sprawl? What is the definition of sprawl? And uh, again, we talked about the second item on that. Number three is it's next to rural character. We've heard a lot about what it is. We hear, we hear definitions every time someone speaks to us about what they determine to be rural character. So in the end, the Ordinance Committee worked diligently to bring to you the three recommendations you see in front of you. And I'd like to underscore the fact that um, in the case of the second recommendation, um, clearly we wish to have more public input into this question. And the way for us to do that is to move the question to a standing committee that has already been authorized by this board to study the growth and open space preservation question. Um, bottom line is we had people who thought ordinance should start to conduct its own 
um, open hearings with the public and almost act in a quasi-judicial way that is not what the charge or the mission of our particular committee. So you have three presentations in front of you. The first is to um, the town council hereby refers to the planning board a recommendation from the ordinance committee to remove Turkey Hill Farm and Lovett Ayers parcel as growth areas that are currently in that, um, that area. Can I just make a suggestion? Why don't we just take each of these one by one, make a motion, discuss it, and vote, Fine. and then go to the next? Because there's so much here that, does that, is that okay? I, I think that's actually okay, a fine. So idea. But, but before we do that, in keeping with our communications policy, uh, <laughs> I'm very proud of the fact that I've remembered at 9.30, if anybody is here who would like to speak to item 104 in all seriousness, we do welcome your comments if you would like to speak to uh, the Ordinance Committee Growth Areas recommendation. I don't know if anybody is here for that reason, but we welcome your comments. Okay. I, I agree with Sarah's suggestion. Oh, sir. I was just trying to give some background. Yeah, well, background. Whoops, hang on. Well, I'm still Peter Eastman, <laughs> but now I'm from Turkey Hill Farm. And uh, I'm just here basically to answer questions about Turkey Hill and what goes on there. Okay. Uh, I don't, know, don't have any comments yet, but uh, if you have questions, maybe I have answers. We appreciate that. Thank you. Should we start with a uh, motion? Okay. Sure. I, I move that uh, the Town Council refer to the Planning Board recommendation from the Ordinance Committee to remove Turkey Hill Farm. R03-20 and Lovett Ayers Possel R01-2 as growth areas. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. And could one, a member of the Ordinance Committee briefly explain the rationale for that, just in case people are wondering? Ann? Uh, I would say that um, these are um, minor, what we would call technical amendments, in that these two parcels, which there were maps in our packet too, but these two parcels have already received, or through other means, they're permanently protected uh, as open space, and so it really seems sort of crazy to have them in the growth area, so we thought just to reflect re the reality of what's actually there, we should remove them from the growth area district. Okay. That's all it was, was a technical correction. Okay. Yes, and, it's, and we have to refer them to the planning board because of the way the process works with the maps, but we ref, that's what we would be referring to the planning board. That and for the, and for the that town council to know that there will be um, ample notification of all of butters yes. to, the, um, to these properties when the actual planning board takes these under I think right as of tonight it will be. They start, right, right. So there was notification for tonight as well. Yes, right. there was no. So, I mean, it's pretty important that that was underscored as part of the Ordinance Committee's directive. Okay. Any further comments? Here we have a motion that's been made and seconded. All those in favor? And the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, Jim, do you I want to... The uh, Town Council hereby amends the charge to the Future Open Space Preservation Committee, known as FOSS, to include a thorough review of growth areas, including a review of the definition of growth areas, the areas designated growth areas within the context of expected growth, all within their review of open space. This review shall include a meeting or meetings where public comment is solicited at the determination of the future open space preservation committee. The committee is also authorized to meet through December 31st, 2012, which is an extension from their original charge, which was to end April 8th, 2012. Second. The motion's been made and seconded. And it's pretty self-explanatory, but again, this goes to one of our objectives about not starting a brand new committee, trying to make efficient what we have in place, and also to underscore the fact we felt there should be more participation from the public as it pertains to this subject matter. Okay. Any further comments or questions? All those in favor of the motion? Motion carries. Thank you. The last item? And the last item is the Ordinance Committee also recommends that the Town Council adopt the following statements of agreement. Uh, statements of agreement, number one, not all development is sprawl. Number two, you don't have to read them. Do you want to, want to say, just take and just as, to accept them as a block? As reflected in our materials, numbers right. one through 11. And do you understand that you had three members who spent many meetings, many hours discussing every one of these items? So right. what you have here is our consensus. 
Okay, so there's a motion that's been made. Is there a second? Uh, Jessica? Second. Okay, is there a discussion or questions? Caitlin? Question, just what exactly accepting the statements of agreement means for town council, for FOSS going forward with this? Just clarification. I, I think I had a similar thought or question, Jim. Is this, an, address it? is this an endorsement? I mean, this means we're all signing on to these. What we're trying to do is we're trying to, to put some context into the discussion. And these are not, um, let's put it this way. I mean, these are not, um, from the town council's point, these are not sort of ordinances to, per se. They're context from which to look at the whole subject. They're not, we're not telling people what to think. I mean, I, I think we were just trying to take this massive subject and bring it into some context for us to evaluate the ordinance and where we need to go from here. Do you have thoughts? Ann, you had your hand up, and then uh, Sarah and Frank. Sure. Ann. Um, I'm a member of the Ordinance Committee, uh, and uh, I, I think, as, um, as Jim says, we, uh, we voted, the three of us being Councillor Governale, Councillor Walsh, and myself, we voted unanimously on these statements of agreement. It was my understanding they were, they were more sort of a framework for our discussion. We, ended, we threw out a bunch of statements that we didn't agree on. But it was to provide context so that people would understand, understand our frame of reference for discussing these things. It was not my understanding that we would be sending these to the council to adopt them. And I would think perhaps it, this is just an idea, I'm thinking off the top of my head, that it might be more useful for the council to just refer these statements of agreement to FOSP and say, these are what, you know, just a statement of fact. Mm -hmm. The ordinance committee voted unanimously on all of these statements of agreements. Please consider this as one piece of information when you're doing your review of open space. Okay. Sarah, Frank, I forgot who was first. I'm sorry, Frank. Sarah, what's Sarah. Oh. Sorry. Everything Ann said, I agree with, and I think. These were sort of the starting point of our process to try to frame the discussion. And it may be helpful for FOSS to have this rather than having to go through some of it themselves. I, I don't think we would intend to do this to constrain them at all. Therefore, I think more as a referral is a better way of approaching it than as a um, acceptance. OK, or, so I would I, I get I'd to take a oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Sarah gets to talk. <laughs> I, I would even go a step further. I guess I was very uncomfortable with this because much as I really, really appreciate all the work you did and um, much of it I agree with and s a few of them I don't agree with, but I had two issues. One is I saw no precedent that we'd ever done this before where we'd sort of given it an official stamp to send it to a subcommittee. So that was, I was kind of like, why are we doing this? And also, um, I'm just uncomfortable. These are huge issues, all of them, and I don't want to give the impression that I'm sort of rubber stamping and saying, you know, FOSS, you have to kind of work within this context because I don't want to, I want FOSS to be completely free, you know, tabula rasa to do what that committee thinks is best. And, and so I agree that this should be handed to them because in the, in the hope that it will save them some work and certainly it's helpful to have guidance from a committee that struggled you know, at length for six meetings with this. So I fully agree it should be handed it to them and explained. I personally will not be voting in favor of adopting it in any official way from the town council because it, it, it feels like um, um, not approval. It feels like an authorization that, that I feel is uh, premature, given that the committee hasn't had time to do its work, and also that I don't actually agree with all of them. So to me, it, I'm uncomfortable voting for them on block. That's just my personal position. Well, uh, well two things. I mean, I, I, can, I can change my, what I propose to make it a referral, which I think is what I'm hearing, or at least seeing as a, a possibility here. I think that, Sarah, in, 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 in um, at least from my perspective, I'll speak for myself, not the three members, but I think we wanted the FOSS group to have the benefit of our work. And I don't believe we had in any way, shape, or manner any belief that we were going to constrain the discussion. We talked a lot about the process 
for FOSS to review this and come back to the town council at some point with whatever they come up with as a recommendation, knowing full well that when it comes back to the town council from a process standpoint, it's probably going to go back to ordinance or it'll go to planning or someplace else for additional discussion before it eventually comes back to town council for adoption. So the long and short of it is, we, I don't think we at all intended it to be anything other than guidance for the work that we did. Can I answer him? Sure, go ahead, Sarah. Uh, I, just, I, I agree, and as I said, I think it's a great to, to provide them this guidance. I just don't think at this point it should be run through the whole council. It's just procedural. Uh, Jessica, you have a hand up. Yeah, um, I attended many of those meetings, and I just I thought that this would essentially be a statement of information and nothing more. Um, and so I would recommend that <clears throat> just as a statement of information, it could be referred to FOSS for FOSS's review, however they choose to, to accept it. So it's almost as if the motion is to, to accept this report from the Ordinance Committee and or refer rec to FOSS. receive. Re I'm sorry. Receive. That's better. Thank you. Receive and then refer it to FOSS. Is that what you, Anne, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, would, I would amend the motion. I can't even remember what the original motion was, but I'd amend it to just say that uh, we receive the ordinance, we, the council, receive the ordinance committee's report, including the statements of agreement, and that we refer the statements of agreement to FOSP for them to consider in their analysis, just as one piece of information. No endorsement by the council or anything. It's just Sending it along. But we never have sent one along before. Why don't we just receive it? Of course, though, it'll... It we send stuff along to other committees all well, the time. Before we get into any more discussion, that, that's a, an amended version of the motion. Uh, Jim, do you accept that amendment? I, I accept that. And then who seconded? Jessica, do you second that amendment? Okay. And Sarah, what's your comment again? I'm sorry. I'm just saying, why don't we just receive it? Thank them profusely and receive it, which is what we usually do. Of course FOSP will get it, but we're not officially handing it to FOSP with our authorization. It's just a different feel. I'm splitting hairs, but I'm just saying we don't usually receive something and officially pass it on to a subcommittee. So I, I, I just wonder why we're doing it now. I just, to go along with what Sarah's saying, I, I feel like if it's coming from the council, the council's saying we agree with all of this and we're handing it to you. And that was my reading through it was why I initially brought this all up was my concern was, is the town council agreeing with all the statements of agreement and passing it along? And I don't want the whole FOSS committee to get the idea that that's what's happening. And so I don't know if we can change it to statements of agreement within the ordinance committee so it's very clear that the statements <coughs> of agreement are not between the ordinance committee and town council, but it's statements of agreement within the ordinance committee, that might help clarify it a little bit. And then I also agree with Sarah about let's just receive it and boss can review it as they choose. Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm sorry, I was trying to take notes and figure out a way around this. Go ahead, Anne, I'm sorry. I, I, perhaps we could, perhaps, I'm not saying move the question, but perhaps we could move the question. And if the question fails, then the ordinance committee at their next meeting could have a vote to send our statements of agreement off. All right, so. Off. But I would like to move the question. All right, the, the, so the, the motion is to receive the report and refer it to FOSP for them to consider in their analysis. As one piece of information okay, the in their analysis. Okay. The motion's been and, made. And have it strictly identified as the Ordinance Committee's uh, statements of whatever they are agreeing. Okay, so, so to receive the report of the Ordinance Committee and refer it to FOSS for, their, for them to consider in their analysis as one piece of information, and it is clear this is coming from the Ordinance Committee. Can I, uh, yes, <laughs> as the person who started this, okay, yes, <laughs> I'd like to, I would like to, amend, to, to change it to, I mean, this is, that uh, uh, I move that the Town Council receive the Ordinance Committee's statements of agreement, period. That, I'll second Okay. Because we have two people on this group who participate in FOSS, or three, and we're going to get the message out. This is what we thought. <laughs> so, fair enough. Okay. Uh, and, and, and second uh, it. And, Somebody. Second. <laughs> and that would not 
prohibit the ordinance committee from mailing this or, or, or Maureen from mailing this or giving this to FOSS, right? I mean, there's no intent to keep it from right. No, I would hope that they would get it. Um, all right. All those in favor of the motion. I'm sorry. The motion is simply we've, we've received it. Yes, it is. Gratitude. With no, no, no gratitude. <laughs> <laughs> no hey, I like the gratitude part. You, you have eliminated gratitude. From <laughs> I know. I was going to say, Sarah, doesn't it feel like there's much gratitude? <laughs> I'm not feeling the love. All right. All those in favor of the motion. Uh, it carries. And I do want to express my gratitude. Uh, no, ser no, seriously. So noted. Say it again. All right. <laughs> to, no, to the Ordinance Committee. This was a tremendous amount of work. So thank you. Okay. Appointments Committee, item number 105-2011. Uh, Jessica. Yes, thank you, <laughs> Chairman Sherman. Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, I want to thank uh, Deborah Lane, the town clerk, for her help with scheduling uh, these, app uh, these interviews. Thank you to all of our wonderful applicants and to the members of the Appointments Committee. We are very pleased to recommend to the Planning Board, Joseph Shalott, and to the trustees of the Thomas Memorial Library, Lee Ro Rudy. Jessica, would you like to make a motion then to? And I, I move that we accept these, uh, no, uh, these nominations from the Appointments Committee. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay, all those in favor? Of, I'm, I'm oh, I'm sorry. Is there any discussion? <laughs> Not trying to cut this off. Any discussion? I'll be extremely brief. I'd just like to say how excited I am that both these gentlemen are, have stepped up to serve on these committees. They're personal friends of mine. I know that they're both great people. They'll put in a ton of work. They're very bright. And um, I just want to thank them for the tireless work ahead. Okay. All right, and I don't see anybody in the public that wishes to comment, so um, all those in favor of the motion? It carries. And thank you to the Appointments Committee for their work on this. I will not use the word gratitude. Uh, item 106-2011, this is the Maine House of Representatives District 121 vacancy, which resulted from the election of Cynthia Dill to the Maine Senate. Uh, it is recommended that the council request Governor Paula Page to schedule a special election to fill the vacant seat uh, in the Maine House of Representatives and that the communication to Governor LePage recommend that he choose November 8, 2011 as a date for the special election. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? All right. Item 107-2011. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Oh, I'm sorry. I just, out of curiosity, how soon does this, this letter go out? Um, I mean, it would go tomorrow. Tomorrow. goes out tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, item 107-2011, the proposed revised fiscal year 2011 budget appropriations. Uh, Mike, could you uh, give us some background here? I'd be happy to. Uh, every year in June, we look at all our different accounts, and uh, the, the town council authorizes uh, appropriations for each department. Uh, occasionally in June, we find that some of the departments uh, have not been able to stay within the original appropriation, and that requires a, re a revised appropriation. So I'm recommending revised appropriations in three different departments because heating costs were greater. Uh, in the general assistance program because there were so many more citizens in need, again, in large part because of heat, uh, 22,000 additional legal fees that we incurred as a result of uh, one issue in particular, and $2,500 in the town council account that we spent for a growth projection study, which was quite helpful. Uh, the, the final one I should mention is intergovernmental assessments. I, I just missed uh, budgeted COG dues and MMA dues. The, the COG dues had a one-year reduction. I thought it was a permanent reduction. It was a one-year reduction. So okay. we get hit with that. But, we hit, but the good news is the health insurance account is to the good by more than the same amount, so it covers all of it. Okay, so we would need a motion then to approve these revised appropriations. So moved. Okay. Is there a second? second? Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Motion carries. Thank you. Item number 108-2011, proposed F fiscal year 2011 designated fund balances. Again, Mike, could you just? Yes, we also, you have the opportunity to designate fund balances or to commit them or whatever the term is. Uh, this is simply designate them. These are all items where appropriations were made this past year in some fashion. 
and uh, for various their works in progress, so they weren't done, or their projects that are going on over several years, and these are the various appropriations uh, that are still in these different accounts, which uh, uh, we recommend not lapse on June 30, 2011. I'd be happy to answer any questions on any individual lines. So, okay, Jessica? Yeah, could you just explain that, but to not lapse, what, what do, you, do you mean by that? If these were not carried forward, they would all lapse into surplus. And for example, uh, undesignated surplus. they'd become undesignated surplus. Frank? Uh, Frank? Uh, so they roll over effectively and they start the new year at these levels? At these levels, plus any additional appropriation there might be for fiscal year 12. Any other questions or comments? Do we have a motion? To accept as proposed. To approve. Second. Okay, so the motion is to approve these designated fund balances for proposed fiscal year 2011. Okay. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Uh, opposed. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> all right. I, all right, although, I was I, the, lingering. Right. I, I had raised it and put it down too fast. I'm sorry. Let me just make sure. All those in favor? Sorry. Okay. All, opposed? Okay. Motion carries unanimously. Um, item 109, 2011, mutual aid agreement. Uh, this was in our package. It's proposed to approve a new fire mutual aid agreement with the town of Scarborough. Would anybody like any background on this? If not, is there a motion? I move that we accept the mutual aid agreement with the town of Scarborough. Is there a second? second? Motion's been made and seconded. Any questions? Um, yes, I just wanted my, if um, you could just review this quickly. Yeah, uh, different communities have mutual aid agreements that basically if we had a bad fire, they'd respond. If we, we have a bad fire, that, you know, that they'd help respond. us. Yeah. And by having mutual aid agreements, it, it covers like, who's responsible for the payroll, who's responsible for liability. And these are standard agreements, uh, you know, from town to town. The, the, it, it's the same provisions, help out Scarborough and help out us. Uh, in this instance, Scarborough, I'm not sure why, but decided to update all the mutual aid agreements, so they're doing this with all the different communities. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised in the next year or so we may see one from South Portland and Portland as a, as a result of Scarborough taking the, the initial uh, initiative on this. Jim. M Michael, are they all the same? Do they use the same template each time? Yes. Uh, the, Scar the Scarborough template that they're using with us is the exact same one they're using with South Portland and Portland. Uh, our template will be a little bit off by doing the Scarborough one, and you know I think we will revisit. We'll, we'll talk to South Portland and Portland and the other places we have it with to try to get them all in the same template. Obviously, those other communities have already agreed to it with Scarborough, so it's uh, so the pretty. Standard, the standard has been. So the standard has been set. Yeah. Okay. Frank, did you? Uh, I know you told us this before. My question to remind me: Can we, get comp can we compensate them when they help us and vice versa? No. And if there's a dramatic imbalance over a period of time, is there any imbalance when that occurs? Yeah, under the agreement there isn't. But you know, if there was some, if there was a real issue or problem that came up, you you, you do look at those issues. Uh, you know, for instance, South Portland has gone back and forth with rescue. Some years, uh, they we help them more than they help us. Mm -hmm. Usually, they help us more, particularly in recent years. But but you know, surprisingly, we do get down there from time to time to help out. With, uh, with rescues, and we do fairly regularly with fires. In fact, we do on the, the uh, down by the shore road station, uh, we respond to lots of, uh, we automatically respond to calls in South Pole, and they automatically respond to calls in Cape. Since as a resident pointed out, a lot of our volunteers are South Pole residents that works well for everyone. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor of the motion? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Item number 110-2011. This is the County Hazard Mitigation Plan. We've been asked to adopt the new Cumberland County Hazard Mitigation Plan. Did anybody have any questions for the town manager before we obtain a motion? Is there a motion? I move to adopt. Okay, a motion's been made to adopt. Any, is there a second? A second's been made by Councillor Lennon. Any questions or comments? 
Okay, all those in favor of the motion. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, this is then the second opportunity for citizens to discuss items not on the agenda. Uh, seeing that no one is left standing, <laughs> we will move forward. Uh, that's true. Um, uh, it's May 31, 2011 financial reports. Mike, are you going to? Okay, thank you. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All right, all those in favor of the motion? All right, thank you. Still Warren, Warren, nothing to fill. <laughs>